and then I'll mute myself as you guys start to discuss. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Friday Facebook Live. This is Tierra International. We are a women's leadership development company. And those of you who've been following us for a while know we try to do this on Fridays, if it all works together technically. And if you miss us on Fridays, we also post our videos on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page, and you can always chime in there. So thank you to all of you who are tuning in live today. I'm Betsy Sobiek. I am tuning in from the Midwest. I'm actually in between spots, as you can tell, so I'll be on mute some of the time. And I have with me today Peg Rowe. Hello. Uh, Francisca Decker. Hi. From and the Andrea, Netherlands. From the Netherlands, and Andrea Henning. Yes, also from the Netherlands today. Also from the Netherlands. And so today we're one week before we celebrate International Women's Day. And so it's something we just wanted to start talking about today. We may in fact continue the discussion in some way, shape or form next Friday. We don't actually know quite yet, but it's important enough that we wanted to start talking about the state of equity, especially gender equity today in the workplace and just share our own experiences with it, share some statistics that we found that give kind of a, a framework of where we actually are, and then also talk about what we think we're, we're seeing actually work in terms of making progress from where we are now to where we want to go. Um, so we'll just see where the conversation goes. I do want to say up front that there's a chance, a very good chance, that we'll have this conversation somewhat imperfectly because we may say something that feels like it offends somebody. We may say something that maybe even isn't well-informed from our point of view or our perspective, but we definitely know we wanna be in the conversation and be talking about it, whatever our point of view <clears throat> and our individual experience have been for ourselves and our clients. So we're gonna go for it. Gender equity, what is the current state of it? Where have we made progress? Where do we seem stuck and how do we feel about it? So with that intro, um, I would leave it to one of you to kick us off. Is there something you want to say just about the current state and what you've experienced? In fact, Peg, I think I would throw it to you because okay. I feel like you have really dug deep into this issue, especially for some of our mentorship programs right. and have a pretty clear idea about where we're starting. Whereas I think I can be a little bit more uh, positive about it like look where we've come and I think you yeah. always ground me with like okay but like <laughs> let's really talk about where we are yeah well and here's the thing I would say I think there is a lot of positive to celebrate so I don't view it as a as a gloomy topic at all um, and I and what I've been intrigued by is um, as we particularly have had the opportunity to be invited into companies and help them really begin to grapple in a very positive way, but also a very productive way with this very issue. I actually am seeing that there are a lot of practices that are being put in place that are definitely and demonstrably supporting women in those organizations. I think <coughs> the disappointment would be that it's not very, not as many organizations as we would like to see. But here's what I am experiencing. One of the things that we've learned in the mentoring programs that we've done is that when we have this opportunity for high potential women who are being developed for leadership and the expectation is that they will be, you know, promoted and in the leadership pipeline and available for opportunities. Uh, when we engage men as mentors, men as senior leaders in organizations as mentors, one of the occurrences is that those men shift during that time often from being a mentor to being an advocate for those women. And that advocacy is the thing I think that is moving the needle in a lot of ways. So by advocacy, I mean that those are individuals who know someone's talent, know their capabilities, and are willing in things like talent review to say, oh, you should be considering this person on this slate. And when that doesn't happen, women tend to work hard, put their nose down, do the best job they can, hope that they get noticed and recognized and promoted. But absent having vocal support makes a huge difference. And so that's one of the things I would point to that has been in the landscape. For a while, I think this was a conversation largely among women around what do we do to help women get promoted? How do we bring women along? And I think one of the things that's occurring is beginning to see 
more organizations supporting high potential women because they see the value. They've got a whole talent pool that they're not tapping into. They want to look more like their customers in terms of having women in those leadership roles. And men are now engaging in ways that are very positive and productive in terms of supporting women. So for me, that's been one of the biggest changes that we've seen in the mentoring programs we do that have actually had an impact. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think what you're saying, I, I hear a couple things in this. One is reminding us that it's an organization, a strategic, a company, or even mm-hmm. a community issue. It's not just a women's problem. Um, and that it's strategic when you're thinking about how do you make progress in equity and in inclusion and that kind of thing for anyone who's underrepresented right. um, in the pipeline or in the leadership roles. And then uh, the other thing I hear you saying is this distinction between mentorship and advocacy, that when you are someone who is in a leadership role in an organization, that yes, you can mentor. And I think another best practice is to mentor people outside of just your own uh, natural style as well to enter a diversity in terms of who you're, like you said, men mentoring women, women mentoring men, et cetera. Um, And also then to even stretch into advocacy. So yes. that you really uh, have a voice for people who might not be representing themselves as powerfully as they could. Exactly. All very, very good and interesting points. Um, and from a European perspective, uh, I know Francisca and the Nether- and uh, Andrea, you've been <coughs> uh, more close to the European market. Is it an issue in Europe as it is in the U.S.? Is there anything you would say about uh, how you're experiencing it there? Mm-hmm. You'd like to say something, Francisca, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it absolutely is a point of attention. And I like how we are talking about um, gender equity because often it's put on the agenda as the gender gap or the empowerment of women that needs to be addressed, which is more from a uh, problem uh, uh, perspective. And what I find is sometimes that it gets indeed uh, uh, on the agenda as a problem that needs to be solved. Whereas uh, uh, the other approach would be, uh, okay, what are, what is, what are the opportunities uh, 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 here? What are the uh, directions for uh, solutions that we can find? And especially remember why it is important. Sometimes it seems like it's just about a thing on the to-do list or on the strategic plan. And um, I see conversations unfold, um, and maybe unwillingly or unknowingly, about, oh yeah, we need to address that too. Uh, okay, let's tackle the problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, what I have noticed is that um, there are a lot of unconscious bias that, um, mm-hmm. that, that, um, uh, don't support a level playing field. And what, 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 what is amazing is that, that, I mean, I don't know anyone here, or they are there of course, but I don't know really personally anyone who wouldn't say it's a good thing that we have equal chances, that there is a balance, all that. However, uh, we have created structures that unconsciously have a filter where, where um, um, women are filtered out uh, so mm-hmm. looking for where the structures has a natural barrier and look at that and what, what can we do to create new structures and put new structures into, into place is a very important thing uh, also to, to work on. And um, so it, with Tiara, we always say like, we want uh, organizations who are really serious about uh, working on this and uh, gender equity because it really, you need to be open to look at your structures and see like, oh my goodness, what we have created here doesn't work. For instance, in academia, and maybe you can say more about that, oh, Siri, Siri is also interfering. <laughs> uh, maybe you can say more about um, what you see in the academic world, how difficult it is with, for instance, the tenure tracks already for women to get in, uh, mm-hmm. to, get, to, to get in there. Yes. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. The acad- uh, academia uh, specifically are um, well. The structures developed there are very uh, are from a, a patriarchic uh, uh, system. There's nothing wrong with yeah. that in principle, uh, but it's it's grown like that. Um, and if it uh, continues, if 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 that continues to be the mold, 
for um, for all to fit into, nothing is really going to change uh, there. So especially it's, it's especially challenging indeed for uh, academia uh, to start uh, uh, making that shift because what needs to be done, uh, what needs to be done is finding. Um, ad addressing the biases, addressing the belief systems, addressing the what is actually driving the structures and how we work uh, 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 together. And um, there is a part of that that doesn't speak so much from the mind uh, and from the analytical and structure way, but speaks from a completely uh, different part of our uh, human uh, being, which is a little bit out of out of the normal for the academic uh, uh, system. When, when when you talk about uh, uh, the 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 heart space, uh, for instance, I mean I can see a change, and and the word love and the word heart is becoming more included uh, even in academia uh, yeah. academic uh, yeah. conversations, but. I see a lot of women who are choosing to just survive within the system because they want to quickly get things done. And they choose in a conversation, for instance, to give the word to a, co a male colleague because they know then the message, message will come across. Mm -hmm. But that's, those are all ways to keep, the structure, to keep the system in place and to continue repeating uh, the history. So nothing is really going to change. Yeah. And I really appreciate how both of you are emphasizing that at this point, a lot of it is systemic. Like these biases yeah. are being perpetuated oh. systemically, yes. that it's not necessarily personal. And there are always personal stories of um, people of all different genders who really have worked really hard or overcome obstacles or are deserving of whatever they've achieved as well. And what we're really talking about is just in these different systems that are in place, how do we change them so that it is equitable opportunity? And again, it doesn't have to be equal, like everyone gets everything exactly the same. But if someone's putting a, you know forth equal effort for a job that, and they're doing it and it's valued at the same way, the fact that women typically still get 77 you know, cents on the dollar or whatever it currently is, and that they just didn't know to ask at a certain point, or they yeah. just entered the system at a lower level. So each incremental raise that they got never really got them to the people that on, the, on, the, on the same plane as them. And so we're just talking about pausing for a second, looking at some of those kinds of factors and going, how do we make it right? How do we make it equitable? Equitable. How do we make it feel like more people have a chance than there than there were before? But it really feels like it is more systemic than personal at this point in a lot of ways, especially when I talk to all the different kinds of people who are passionate about trying to find yeah. a solution. Yeah, I, I think part of it, Betsy, does go back to um, recognizing that in these different scenarios, we have to have the opportunity for leadership to be able to make the case for why would we want it to be equitable? What would be the, the benefit of having it be equitable? Because if it feels like it's worked this way so for so long, what's the need for a change? And I think a lot of the companies that we work with are seeing that, again, they have this untapped talent pool of women and other underrepresented re represented groups who they want to be able to tap into because the business is going to be better as a result of that. And then we have customers who are becoming much more astute and looking to see which companies really represent that value for me, which really, which companies really re represent having women and underrepresented groups in places of leadership. And that ties to my, my value. So I think there are a lot of other not pressures as much as subtle awareness that's coming about, that's having organizations really look at this at, from a different perspective, not just from a perspective of, you know, sort of internal desire to have fairness, which is obviously the way a lot of companies would represent themselves. But beyond that, what, what happens if we don't do that? What's the cost to us as an organization? We're going to lose talent. We don't want to lose talent. We're going to potentially impact our customers in a way we don't want to. So I think there's a lot of, you know, might, might seem as peripheral benefit that is now being looked at in a much more um, um, impactful way as, as the decisions are being made. Yeah, I can yeah. hear, you know, some of our listeners probably reacting to that, like, well, we shouldn't have to prove it. 
It's just right. the right thing to do. Right. Yet at the same time, in some of these established companies, everything they do is through the lens of business case and strategy. Mm -hmm. So right. I think we're also talking about in terms of making the change, what's the evolutionary changes that can happen by changing the systems from within? And what are the revolutionary oh, things mm -hmm. that people can do to put things on their heads? And I know that in some circles, um, the younger generation, the millennials, and even people younger than the millennials get kind of a bad rap, but I'm excited. Because I actually yeah. feel like if there's going to be revolutionary change where people yeah. just do things different mm -hmm. based on new systems, it's going to really come from young people who are just aren't going to do it the old way, oh, right. which I think <laughs> is very exciting. Yes. Yeah, it's very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. The other thing that uh, coming back to structures is that... Um, um, that the, the, the structures that are still in place, they're, they're coming from a patriarchal system. So they naturally favor what we call, would call more masculine leadership traits more than the feminine. And just, just for instance, like vision is a part of the masculine feminine trait and connection uh, one of the feminine. So they are kind of equal. If you look at both lists and I don't have them present, so please don't ask me about having the whole list. But, but um, they are equally important. If you look at them, there's not one list better than the other. However, um, our patriarchal system, they favor more the, the, uh, the masculine leadership traits. And we, when you look at women, uh, at a certain point, we have uh, had um, brought together a learning community of women in science that they had, um, of course, they had this scientific, like the mind, like the intelligence, and, and also the content and the, um, the interest in the science, but what they also had, they were inclusive. They had the connection piece. They had the piece of um, sustainability, all, all that. And what they did was they took care of that inside of their organization. They took care of that piece, but they weren't valued for that. So mm -hmm. it took time out of their focus, but they weren't valued because there were nothing that said like, oh, bonus, like how is your team doing? Are they, um, are they having a good atmosphere to, together? So there were no way to actually honor that, to come to a, um, uh, a rewarding system of that. And they got really tired of that, but it was so close to their, to their values. And what I see is that part of, as part of the evolution, as part of living in the, in the VUCA world in, in, in a higher complexity, mm -hmm. something like connection and relationships become more important. So it's really, all, already for our survival, we need to change the structures to, uh, to make it possible that female leadership traits, whether they are in men or in women, get a chance to blossom. Otherwise, we, we will not make it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that, um, that there are some people who also watching to this who may be wondering, well, how bad is it really? Like we've made so much progress. Aren't things better? Is it something we really need to pay attention to? And um, I do think pausing, and I typically pause around this time. So around International Women's Day, I'm always reminded that the day itself, it's not just about acknowledging women because we're women, <laughs> but it's like really <laughs> acknowledging that there have been hardships we've overcome. There are milestones that we've reached, particularly in the domain of economic empowerment and political empowerment and things like yeah. that. And that it didn't come easily and it wasn't just assumed to happen, that we had to really go for it and, and just acknowledge what we've done along the path to do that. And there are a couple reports. So I know our um, business partner, Beth Rusky, who's not on this call, she sent us around um, something called the 2018 Economic World Forum, I think it is. Let me look at the type. Um, World Economic Forum report. Um, and we're going to include that in a link below. So for those of you who are like, but what really is the current state of the world? I'm going to include a few different scorecards. And this particular one is nice because it looks at four different dimensions of gender equity. Again, not having to be totally equal, but just equitableness across these four dimensions. One is economic. So in terms of work and money making and money spending and that thing. Another is political. Another is academic. So access to education and literacy and all of those components. And then the third is health and survival. So health, well-being, and even just plain surviving. And across the world on all of those dimensions, um, it still is lagging women in terms of their equitable 
participation in those four dimensions, it's behind the men. Now, different countries may be more advanced. It says that Iceland, actually, as you guys wouldn't be surprised since you spent a lot of time in Iceland, is the most equitable at this point. Um, but even there, their ranking is 85% as opposed to like 100, 100. Mm -hmm. So um, it's something that you can look at as far as like, what is the baseline? What are we talking about? And I think those four dimensions are interesting. Like there are yeah. still places where over 20% of women are not literate. And if people don't have access to education or literacy, how are they empowered to do whatever it is they wanna do in their lives, et cetera. So I don't know when you guys see the statistics um, if that triggers anything for you guys, either as a surprise or um, it feels like it's what you would expect, uh, anything like that. I know Beth said that around a little bit earlier this week. Any thoughts on on the numbers? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I would share, you know, Beth's concern that it feels like we're operating at a pretty slow pace to create that more equitable um, dimension, particularly as it relates to the economic realm. Um, and at the same time, I, you know, we see definitely signs of progress and can tell that women are advancing in areas that they had not advanced before, that fields are becoming more open to women than have been open before. So there is a both hand. There's like, yes, it's slow, it's painfully slow, and we're making progress moving forward. So I don't think we want to take our eye off the off the end game in terms of making sure that there is that equitable piece. And I also do think that we want to be celebrating progress as it occurs and then encouraging it and learning from the progress and embedding those things into organizations and, and cultures that will allow that progress to accelerate. Mm -hmm. And I think there's still a lot of work to do when we um, uh, look across the border. I mean, I've lived in, uh, uh, in Africa for, uh, for quite some time and we are traveling um, a lot also to Arab countries. And so from the standpoint of a woman, I, I think that um, we have also an, a responsibility to uh, the progress that especially our mothers also have generated and that we are now um, uh, benefiting from, that we are not, we are not done until until there is this this freedom and uh, and equity and uh, and level of playing field in all in all countries, um, there are a lot where it's not. That's true. And when we think of it, it's International Women's Day. It's not exactly. one country or another, but it's international. And so, really having that international perspective, where you know, I think things like personal safety and health are huge issues in some parts of the world that they may be less of an issue in the Western world, for example. And sometimes exactly. we're, we're not as aware of that and, and as aware yeah. of, of the health risks that it is just to be a woman. Yes, exactly. And the choice, the choice, the yeah. personal choices that, that, um, that women can, uh, can make. And um, yeah, there's often the excuse about religion or culture. Uh, and I think you, 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 you can only make a choice when you are conscious about the choices that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you are, when you are brought up with the idea that you are not equal, it's very difficult to get step out of that. So yes. I, I've, I've found that this is a, a responsibility to have the conversation mm -hmm. and meet everyone where they are, not with our Western values, but mm -hmm. enter the conversation um, to this, to this uh, rising consciousness and freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I like Andrea how you're talking about uh, responsibility, and I think there is a difference between thinking and having a responsibility, mm -hmm. and actually feeling the responsibility. And this is what has uh, made it possible for Iceland to be on the front, uh, on the be championing in uh, in terms of uh, 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 gender equity, because they have systemically, at the level of the country found it important to make uh, gender equity, uh, to, to make it a political, to make it an item, to make it like a, I don't know how, uh, uh, I, I, I cannot find the name, uh, how to refer it, but to, to really, they jointly feel it is important. So it's on the agenda and they have translated that urge, that intrinsic motivation into very clear um, um, actions, uh, which are then uh, also easier uh, to take. Mm. Um, so that, that that feeling part is definitely something that um, I think is is important, and uh, we can um, um, we can add to 
to in, uh, increasing that by, by talking about it and um, also referring back to ourselves then how do we, how do we feel about it it's easy to talk about a system about a, an organization but we also touched upon everything being systemic and that means that we even the four of us are not separate from uh, from those organizations out there and all those countries out uh, uh, there so also bringing back the questions to ourselves what can we do mm -hmm. is um is an interesting uh, is an interesting mm -hmm. one yes mm. yes another yeah. place for this conversation that's intriguing to me is in the idea of how are we raising this next generation? So that's to your point, like it's exciting to see the millennials and those just, you know, that come after the millennials who are really pressing for change and seeing the world in a different way. And I have a real curiosity as to, you know, in that environment, how will that shift the beliefs um, of young boys and young girls that will then shape how they come to this question as they reach adulthood? Uh, it feels like part of the sea change is going to happen because it starts much younger. It's not about rethinking things or shifting beliefs when someone is already older and established in their beliefs, but actually how are we building a different belief set in very young people so that it's really not a question or an issue when they come to the place that they're in the working environment. Right. And that we're not threatened by yeah. that and really yeah. allow them to take over. I mean, I think that's the other thing. I love the question yeah. of what can you actually do? I know that when I look at the statistics, I can get really overwhelmed by all of the issues and the depth and breadth of the problem. And we're only even looking at gender, not even other right. issues of inequality in the yeah. world. And so sometimes I feel like I resist the data and the picture of what so because it almost feels like crippling to me instead of inspiring. So yeah. it is really helpful for me to ask, okay, so what can I do and break it down for myself, whether it's one dimension like literacy, like I can't imagine not being able to read. And so if I helped people who can't read as grown ups learn to read, that would be like a thing or with the work that we do, if we help women feel like they're in the driver's seat of their careers and they don't have to like sit in the back seat anymore, but they can ask for things right. in ways that work, et cetera. Um, and I think another thing for me is to get out of the way if I do, I feel like I'm stuck in an old system or something and with people yeah. who are coming up and have new ideas, yeah. new ways of leading, new ways of yeah. doing work, whatever they might be. Because one of the other things that I see happen a lot is that people say, yes, 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 everything should be equitable, but it should be for, the, for someone else because I've worked really hard for my thing or the way that I'm doing mm -hmm. it is well-deserved or whatever. So it should be equitable for everyone else and for yes. me i should take yes. my deserved place because i've worked so hard so how do yeah. i stop myself from just getting entrenched like you said francisca in the system itself myself and just constantly be like what what's the future vision how can i be part of change how can i be more inclusive how can i challenge my own biases how can i step down and step aside to let a whole new way to emerge that i can't even imagine because i actually like one of my skills and strengths is working within a system like understanding a system and then working, that's change yeah. management, that's what I do. And so I want to be really willing and ready to like jump to a new system when there is a new yeah. one, instead yeah. of just like always figuring out how to work within mm -hmm. the current one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I love this question of what can you actually do? I mean, are there other practical things that we've seen our clients do or that we've done ourselves that we feel like have made progress towards this vision of equitable opportunity, equitable recognition and reward, inclusion, the setting aside of unconscious bias, what, what really actually works? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, some of it is, is actually getting down to that personal level. So getting to that place of helping reframe what are behaviors, inviting women to, meeting, to meetings, making sure that women have a place at the table. Um, making room for other opinions, making room for a different point of view, um, acknowledging that this exists not as a function of blame or guilt, but simply saying, hey, you know, to the earlier points that we've made, if we want to drive change, then we actually have to acknowledge current state and we have to create the vision for what we want in the future and drive towards that and actually make that concerted effort. 
So, I mean, what I'm seeing at the individual level, I think there's an awful lot that, that individuals can do we, as opposed to wait, sitting back and feeling like, well, the organization's got to figure it out because I'm, I'm just one person. I can't do that. I think there's a lot that individuals can do to create their own version of inclusion and the own, their own way of how they include and create opportunity for other people to simply get involved and have their voice heard. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I have always uh, been able to maintain a, a positive outlook on the world, no matter what happened. And I, I figured out why it was because I always was were drawn to change agents. I, I am one myself, also I'm a pioneer. And so if you work with change agents, um, then then change agents want to make a difference in the system and they are kind of capable of doing it so working with women change agents now we are also involved in a program where women have their own projects to uh, change the system in their countries and these are really really brave uh, women and helping them figure out how to do it strengthening them with the wisdom that we have um, is, uh, is is really really great so i I think with Chiara, we are actually doing that. We are doing what we can. I think Chiara exists because, because of that, because of kind of we are all called of what can we do, um, starting with ourselves, but then also inspiring others to live, lead their lives from inspiration. And inspiration also comes from wanting to make something better, wanting to change something. And um, yeah, that is what I, what, I, uh, what, what I love most doing. Yeah, I know that we've also had great success in strategic mentorship programs, like mentoring itself as a structure, so that mm -hmm. it's not just like you should find a mentor, but like how do you yes. really be a mentor in a more inclusive way, moving toward the advocacy that we started talking about, and then how do you look for mentors that then can also help pave the way. So that's like a practical thing when done with intention does seem to work. Um, I also think, like you said, Andrea, we do tend to like buoy each other. Like when we can see for someone else that they're stuck, then an outside observer can be like, hey, you're stuck and it's not equal for you. So we can help that person see something that they're a part of, but then also know what to do. Um, and that we just tend to cheer each other on that way. Um, and then I do think it's like in our own corner, making sure that we're being the change that we want to see. Are we being inclusive in how we're leading our lives? Are we partnering with men and all genders the way that we would want to be partnered with ourselves? Like, I know it's kind of a, a old saying at this point, but be the vision that you want in your own right. corner of the world and that that would make a difference. And then of course, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can get involved. Like some of the links that we'll send that are, the statistics, if there is a particular dimension that you're inspired by, if there is a path you want to go down and really start making change, like by all means, there's a ton of great organizations really committed in um, all those dimensions, the economic, exactly. the academic, the political, right. and the health and well-being to make sure that, that equity is achieved in our lifetime as opposed to having to wait mm -hmm. like four generations into the future that we would never see. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other last uh, ideas, practical, practical ideas or um, pieces of wisdom, things that you would share? As we uh, I, I would say one of the other uh, down, sort of downstream benefits of the mentoring programs that we participated in is that it also has created a cohort of women who then are there for each other because often then when women are in these roles and they tend to be the solo in it, they can feel like they're the only ones. And so having that opportunity to be in dialogue with and in community with other women who are also, you know, developing and growing as leaders um, really creates a positive impact and a positive environment for those women to flourish. Right. I think that answers one of the questions, like why are there women's programs? It's not to exclude yes. men no. or to then try to battle against something, but it's just to provide women who may have to go that extra effort or challenge themselves differently to have an environment in which they really can be supported and succeed just to reach that point of equity. Yeah. 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 I think one, one of the points, and I think, um, also people, especially women who have made it in the system or, or up the ladder, 
um, kind of don't want to um, get into so much that they are women. Um, I was one of them. I was uh, I was raised in a in a school where we're only girls, and I I kind of wow, I want I I don't want to have anything to do with uh, with that until I became a mother, and then I, I I fell into the classical trap, and there was this acknowledgement to myself, uh, admitting like oh my god, yeah, it it is the women trap in a way. So so kind of um, whether you have kind of made it or not to pause for a moment and say, yeah, but I am a woman and how can I get engaged in helping other women? Um, how or how how am I, I biased where I don't help other other women? Or so just this pausing and getting present to that you are, whatever that may, means would be a, a nice first step and then get engaged in a way, how, yeah, what, what, what can I do to forward? Yeah. Um, forward it. And forward it so it really uplifts everybody. Yes, together. exactly. Yes. Awesome. Well, I will include some links to some of these reports so people can have uh, statistics if they'd like them to motivate themselves. And we appreciate you tuning in. Over the next week, we'll be sharing, I think, a blog post and maybe some other things around International Women's Day if you're curious about what that day celebrates, where it came from. Um, I will also share, I can't remember who said the quote, but maybe one of you guys do, but I love this quote, so I'll end on it. And it's the quote of, if you don't have the seat, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring your own folding chair. Oh, that's <laughs> great. That one? That's so great. I love I've that. seen that a couple of places, so I'll include yeah. actually yes. who said that, yeah. but I would yeah. leave us on that note of, if you don't have a seat at the table, just bring your own folding chair. There you go. Yes. And yes. Go. go for it. Yes. Thank you guys for having this conversation. Much appreciated. Thanks to all of you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right. We're signing off. Thank you for everyone who's watching either live or the recording. And again, you can find us on Facebook, on YouTube, and then also LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you.